but I think it will serve for this morning. I invite you to listen for God's word as it comes to us from the hand of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church in Philippi, the book of Philippians, the first chapter, verses 12 through 21. Listen for God's holy word. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have actually advanced the gospel. The whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else knows that I'm in prison for Christ. Most of the brothers and sisters have had more confidence through the Lord to speak to the word boldly and bravely because of my jail time. Some certainly preach Christ with jealous and competitive motives, but others preach with good motives. They are motivated by love because they know that I'm put here to give a defense of the gospel. The others preach Christ because of their selfish ambition. They are insincere, hoping to cause me more pain while I'm in prison. What do I think about this? Just this. Since Christ is proclaimed in every possible way, whether from dishonest or true motives, I'm glad and I will continue to be glad. I'm glad because I know that this will result in my release through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It is my expectation and hope that I won't be put to shame in anything. Rather, I hope with daring courage that Christ's greatness will be seen in my body now as always, whether I live or die. God's holy word. So let us ponder together whether stubbornness is ever considered a virtue. Most often it is not. Stubbornness is usually equated with closed-mindedness and obstinance, the conviction that one truth only exists and that you hold that truth. Stubbornness is rarely considered to be a virtue. You perhaps are familiar with the story of a husband and a wife who went for a Sunday drive, they began a big argument over something very small. And the argument became way out of proportion to what the issue was. And finally, they stopped speaking to each other. There was an uncomfortable, awkward, cold silence in the car for the longest imaginable time until their drive took them through a pasture and they saw a young boy trying to pull a long-eared mule across a narrow bridge. That mule began to balk and he dug his heels in. He wasn't crossing that narrow bridge. The more the young boy pulled, the greater the mule dug his heels in and the greater that mule balked. So the husband turned to his wife and asked, is that a relative of yours? <laughs> the choir behind me is having too much fun. <laughs> to which the wife answered, oh yes, on my husband's side. Stubbornness is rarely considered a virtue, except here in the most beloved passages of all of Scripture. In the first chapter of Philippians, Paul demonstrates that stubbornness can be a virtue. Paul, right now, is in prison. He's not only in prison, but he is in poor health. He is cut off from his loved ones. He is being taunted by people who want to make fun of his poor state of health and his condition of being a prisoner in Rome. They're taunting him with the knowledge that he is already aware of that Rome intends to execute him. And he is disappointed that he never realized his dream of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the nation of Spain. That is the conditions under which Paul is writing this letter. And in these verses that I've shared with you, 
we see remarkable stubbornness that provides a guiding light and a strength for every one of us when we experience dark and dismal circumstances in our own life. Let me explain. What we see here, first of all, is that Paul stubbornly refuses to give in to self-pity. Notice what is happening in this passage. He stubbornly refuses to give in to self-pity whatsoever. People are taunting him because he is ill of health. He is scheduled to be executed by Rome. He's in a prison. He's separated from his loved ones who could provide encouragement and strength to him. And he is gravely disappointed that he could never get into Spain to preach the gospel there. It is enough to cause anyone to fall into self-pity. And what does he do? He writes this letter to the church in Philippi to give them hope and encouragement for their future as the body of Christ. He writes a letter of hope and of encouragement because of, I'm going to lower this because it's catching that Velcro that doesn't work anymore. I see the people in the sound booth are panicking. What's wrong with the sound system? It's the Velcro. I'll have my robe next week, I promise. I got a thumbs up. The Apostle Paul, rather than falling into the darkness and the despair that his circumstances demand, writes a letter of hope and encouragement to another church. Perhaps you're familiar with the Roman god Janus. Some of you may be invested in the Janus Fund. Uh, the Roman god Janus is responsible for the naming of the first month of the year, January. If you're familiar with the Roman god Janus, Janus has two faces. One that is looking back on the past year with despair and disappointment. And the other face is looking into the new year with expectation and confidence in what is to come. What Jesus Christ does for you and for me is turns our gaze away from self-pity to confidence and hope. I want to teach you something that is very important about reading the New Testament. Everywhere in the New Testament where the word hope is used as it's used here, hope is not used as wishful thinking. Like I hope for my birthday I will receive something. You can substitute the word confidence for the word hope and it will be accurate. So whenever hope is used in the New Testament, it is demonstrating, I am absolutely certain, I am absolutely confident that this will come to pass. What Paul is stating is that I'm absolutely confident that Christ is alive and at work in the world and is at work through my efforts and that the future belongs to God. Paul stubbornly refuses to engage in self-pity because of his absolute confidence and the power of Christ at work in his own ministry. Self-pity is very enticing. I don't know if you have struggled with self-pity, but I know that it is often coming up in my own life as something that I long for and want to participate in because things are dark and they are not going my way. And Paul stubbornly refuses to participate in self-pity. I shared with this congregation some years ago that in my senior year of my graduate studies of theological preparation for ministry, uh, there was a professor, a beloved professor of Columbia Theological Seminary, Ludwig de Witz, who suffered a crippling stroke. He never married. He was now retired, living in faculty housing across the street from the campus of Columbia Seminary, and he suffered a devastating stroke and lost the use of his right hand, his right arm, and only had some use of his right leg. I didn't know him, but his reputation preceded him. And I was asked by the dean of students if I would move in with him for a semester and help him in his convalescence. You understand, of course, that 
I was focused on completing my theological studies, and though I felt sorry for a professor that was well-loved, but I never knew, I said no. Selfishly, I said no. But they said, Doug, we will return to your account all the charges for housing, and we will pay you a stipend of $100 a week. And suddenly my no became yes. And it became one of the most meaningful and important relationships of my life. It was my own Tuesdays with Maury experience. I said to him early in our relationship as, as I was living in his home, Dr. Blewett, what is it like? What is it like to use the use of your right arm and your right hand? And he looked at me with puzzlement and he says, you think I'm stuck, don't you? I'm not stuck. I just have a difficulty to overcome. My car is now in the garage being specially equipped so that I can still drive it using my left hand and my left arm. I have in today's mail music for one hand piano. I've always enjoyed playing the piano. I can't use my right hand and my right arm, true, but my left arm works. And they write music for one hand piano. Doug, I'm not stuck. I just have a difficulty to overcome. There is an example of someone who stubbornly refuses to engage in self-pity. Paul teaches us his stubbornness here in Philippi. I will overcome the difficulties that I'm experiencing. But the second thing that we see is that he stubbornly refuses to be shaken by criticism. We see right here in this text that he acknowledges that there are people who are criticizing his ministry. They're not only mocking him for his current state of being a prisoner in Rome facing execution, they are criticizing the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how poorly they said he has done it. But he says in verse 20, I am confident that my life will be found to have been pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. I am confident that all that I've done has been pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not be shaken by criticism. He stubbornly refuses to allow criticism to impact him in any way. There's a wonderful story of a pastor in a church who was preaching a sermon on the stewardship of gifts. Not the stewardship of financial giving, but the stewardship of gifts. Preaching from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, talking about how every one of us have received some gift, that if we use that gift in a meaningful way in the church, the church becomes stronger, its impact in the community becomes greater. Everyone has the opportunity to participate in something much greater than themselves. At the end of that worship service, a man came up to the pastor and said, Pastor, I am not gifted. I am not gifted to teach Sunday school. I am not gifted to sing in the choir. I am not gifted to serve on any of the committees of this church. I simply don't have that gift. I have one gift and one gift only. Well, what is that gift, asked the pastor. He said, I have a remarkable gift to offer reconstructive criticism. I am in a capacity to criticize your sermons. I can criticize the choir. I can criticize the judgment of the governing board. What should I do with this gift? What would you say as a pastor? I hope I never have someone ask me that question, but I will follow the lead of the pastor's response. The pastor said, I point you to Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. To one was given one gift, to another had given three gifts, to another five gifts. To the one who was given only one gift, he buried it in the ground, and I'd recommend you do the same thing. <laughs> Paul stubbornly refuses to be shaken by criticism. And then finally, Paul stubbornly refuses to quit. He had every reason in the world to quit. He was very ill and facing execution. And not one member of his family was able to have access to him in his prison in Rome. And of course, 
the disappointment loomed large as evidenced by repeated reference in his letters that he so wanted to preach the gospel in Spain and was denied that opportunity. It would have been so easy for him to quit. But he says right here, I will continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and write these letters of encouragement for as long as I have breath in my lungs so that Christ name may be known in the world and Christ's name lifted up and glorified, I will not quit. I may be sick. I may be in prison. I may be facing execution. And yes, my greatest dream of preaching in Spain has never come to fruition, but I will not quit. It reminds us all, doesn't it, of a most loved character in American history who was a lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, who ran for the legislature and lost, started his own business and bankrupted and worked years to pay every cent of debt, fell in love with a woman who passionately loved him, but then she died before they could be married. He ran for Congress and was elected, but when he ran for re-election, he lost. He sought to become the head of the Department of Land in the United States government and lost that. He ran to be nominated as the vice president and lost that nomination. And when he did become the president of the United States, he had to face squarely a division of our nation in the Civil War and would have given his own life to prevent that. And to today, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. reminds every one of us that here is a man who stubbornly refused to quit when he had loss after loss after loss and was used mightily by God to heal a nation that was torn apart. Paul is such a man. When he had every reason to quit, when the world could not be darker and despair could not be greater, he said, I will not quit because it is Christ that is working through me. And I am confident that Christ's work through me will change lives for generations. And it has. The letter he wrote in the midst of this is a part of the New Testament today. Lincoln has his memorial. Paul has given us two-thirds of the New Testament because of his stubbornness, Paul's stubbornness not to collapse with self-pity, not to be shaken by criticism, and his stubbornness never to quit regardless of how dark the world may become for him. Paul teaches us the strength of stubbornness. Claim it for yourself. Amen. Let us stand with our closing hymn.